Welcome to the third episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 15th of March 2010, and in this episode we're going to interview Ivanka Magic, the design team lead at Canonical. We'll review an ebook reader, we'll have a contributed command line love, and we will of course cover your latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, and feedback. I'm Davey, and with me this week is... Tony. Hello, Hello, Tony. It's very empty here. It is, isn't it? I mean, where's everyone gone? I don't know. They've got somewhere better to be than this, clearly. Clearly. Just the three of us here this evening. And we've had to put like a cuddly tux on a chair just to pretend to be, well, let's not say which one, but just pretend to be somebody else. Um, I'm all right, Dave. How are you? I can't complain, Tony. I can't complain. So what have you been up to, Tony? Um, Not very much, really. I'm back on the academic cycle at the moment. I've got like essays and stuff due in. So I've been working away on that. The only thing I have done is to get the remote control that Alan lent me last the last recording session, a cheap one that he got off of eBay, um, and to get it working with Myth TV um, and Myth Buntu. Other auction sites are available. Auction sites are available, yes. And the... um, it was one of these weird remotes that appears as a combined mouse and keyboard. So rather than using Lurk, which is the um, infrared controller standard package, I had to configure all the key mappings and things and did it that way instead. Once I'd worked out that was the right way to do it, life got a bit easier. For a while I was quite wound up. So now Lurk's in a place where it's easy to install, work and configure. Yeah. You moved away from it? Well, yes, because I didn't need it at all in the end. And it wasn't as easy to... It was easy to install and turn on, but it was less easy to actually work with the hardware I had. It's but no, it was fine. I, you know, literally, I was able to use the MythWeb interface to put the new character codes in, and it, it worked. And pause works. That was the main thing it didn't work was pause, and now it works. Anyway. Uh, can I just point out the same remote works perfectly fine with Boxy, with yeah. zero effort? Just, just pointing that just out. Just pointing there. that out, yeah. <laughs> to the Myth Buntu developer <laughs> in the room. We're obviously a Myth TV hater, Alan. Clearly. No, no, I understand there's more to that, isn't there, Alan? What have, what have you been up to, Mr. <laughs> yeah, Pope? Uh, well, yeah, okay. Um, my TV aerial broke at Ooh. home, which is a real pain. And for some reason, this made me think I need to increase the amount of TV-based hardware that I have in the house. Got withdrawal symptoms. Yes, so I've I've started having a look again at Myth TV. Mm. Um, because I've looked at it in the past, and I've had a play with it, and... The way my house is wired up and stuff just doesn't lend itself, or didn't lend itself to playing with Myth TV, and now it kind of does. And now, because you're in a rock and a hard place, you need a new solution. Exactly. You're going to really go for it hardcore this plus, time. Plus, I also have those Acer Revo things, the ion-based things. Yeah. Which Actually, all three of us have them, I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. Well, they're pretty good. <laughs> and so I've, I'm led to believe they work quite well as Myth TV front ends. So I thought, hmm, I've got two of them. They would be good. So is the conclusion that Boxy broke your aerial then? Are you having to switch to Myth TV? <laughs> I no, I think actually Snow broke my aerial. Actually, it might have been using open source software, actually. Yeah, um, that must be it. I am yeah. evil. I think what it might have been is the dodgy aerial engineer guy. Because oh. this is the second time it's broken, and I'm not calling the same guy again. Hang on, he's the guy that you recommended me to have my aerial installed. And me, actually. You <laughs> yeah. <recommend. laughs> yeah, well, I retract that now. Have you both had work done by him? <laughs> yeah, no, well, I have. I oh, haven't, okay. no. no. Well, don't. To be fair, my aerial is up there, and it's... It's doing it's well, there's nothing wrong with the aerial. It's the amplifier. It's ah, right. just gone Actually, fun. I haven't got one of those. Tony, when I walked into your that house, was I did. Was it? Yeah. Right, okay. Tony, when I looked up your house, I looked at that aerial and I thought, that aerial, he's done a good job with that. Yeah, he's done a good job. I, I did think that. Yes. Anyway, Dave, what have you been up to? Uh, I, I've been, well, actually, I've not long been back from a canal boat. Now, for the people Excellent. who aren't English here, um, I think they have canal boats around the world, don't they? Oh, yeah, but some they countries have don't have long enough heritage to know what, 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 the, what this <laughs> You're is. talking about America now, aren't you? I, I did not say that. <laughs> I did, uh, Mr. Pope, you're putting words in my mouth there. <laughs> okay. um, but no, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's been quite good. You just uh, spent the weekend doing that. and uh, With the family? Uh, yes, uh, going nowhere fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. You said did it. Did it have Wi-Fi? <laughs> Actually, I did have Wi-Fi via my phone. <laughs> oh, of course. Ah, uh, right. Uh, yeah. The wonders of modern technology. When I used to go canal boating as a kid, you couldn't get a phone signal, never mind a data connection. <laughs> it, it was a bit touch and go, but actually I did find, whilst I was at the helm, I was actually doing some work this morning. 
<laughs> ah. I, I was actually SSH'd into a server while steering the boat. <laughs> by while not steering the boat. <laughs> well, to be f- oh, yeah, if you're doing it on the motorway at 70 miles an hour, you could cause an accident. There's not much damage you could do a canal boat you, at you, three miles an hour. You'd be surprised. Things creep up on you a lot faster than you'd expect. Yes, yeah, nails, about, about three miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Overtaken by stationary objects. <laughs> well, one of the things we wanted to do is we had, we had some feedback saying that we haven't really introduced ourselves this season. Um, and there's usually sort of five of us here presenting. There's only three today. So what we're going to do is each week we're just going to give one of us an opportunity to give a little kind of two-minute introduction of who they are and, you know, why they're doing this podcast. <laughs> why on earth they're here? Why actually, I don't know about you, Alan, but you're going to agree with me here that the first person this week should actually be Tony. Yes. Ah. <laughs> right. Okay. So, Tony, Hi. who are you? Okay. So, my name is Tony, Tony Whitmore, and um, uh, my IRC nickname is Tony Tiger, or if it all breaks, it's just Tony. Um, on Twitter, I'm Tony Whitmore on Twitter and Identica. My website is tonywhitmore.co.uk. So that's where you can get in contact with me. Um, I'm uh, a Linux, I'm an IT manager by sort of trade uh, at a sixth form college, uh, sorry, a further education college. And um, I, I've been a Linux sysadmin and a uh, tweaker of systems and media geek for a, a long time now. Um, and I do video stuff on Linux and um, play with all that sort of stuff. And um, and that's why I'm here, really. I'm mm. not a developer. Um, I've tried and failed to program things on several occasions. Yeah, I've seen your code. Yeah, the best I can do is bash scripts and some quite good bash scripts, you know. But um, yeah, that's why I'm here and uh, I enjoy it. Cool. We'll do another one of those next time. And, uh, and, and Tony, I must say, is a good chap. Possibly the most uh, sarcastic member of, of, of the crew. I, I don't that, know. That is a challenged role, yeah, though. It is. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll have to worry later who gets the next time round. Sounds like a fun packed show. So, Tony, you're sporting quite a flashy device there, aren't you? What is it? Tell us about it. Thank you very much. Um, oh. It's. Actually, um, not well, I'm not sporting it right now. Alan is sporting it. I'm um, playing with Alan Tony's new toy. It. Um, it's a uh, an ebook reader called a cooler ebook reader, um, which we've been given to review. So that's what we're going to do right now. Um, it is one of the cheaper end of the uh, of the of the spectrum. Um, we like that. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so it's only about 190 pounds in the UK, which is I think a lot of them are kind of 250 uh, and upwards. Um, it is also one of the lighter end of the uh, of the spectrum as well. A lot of them weigh a few more grams um, than that one. I can't remember exactly how how many it is. I want to say um, no, I can't, it's about seventy nine grams or something like that. I might be wrong. It is quite light. It, it feels. Is very light. It feels. If I want to say the word flimsy, but that's separate from weight. It do, it, it doesn't feel very robust. Well, uh, it weighs in under, under 170 grams. I do beg your pardon, okay. um, but I think there's a, I think there's a legitimate point there is that it does feel a little bit flimsy as well. Although it's got a sort of a brushed look to it, it's only a plastic casing, as you p- probably expect. Um, but the uh, that does lend it just sort of flexes a little bit on the back and stuff when you're when you're holding it. I mean, not so much that <laughs> says Alan trying to break it, not trying to flexing snap it, it but... flexing it over his knee. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so it it is got a little bit of flex to it. The build quality is not fantastic. Um, while I was using it, just reading a book, uh, a screw fell out the back of it. Yeah, I've noticed there's two missing. At the yeah. Back. <laughs> to be fair, it is a review in it. I am at least the second person to have got my hands on it. So somebody else might have taken it apart and not put the screws back properly. So hang on, Tony. Dave, what does it actually do and what's it for? Okay, an ebook reader is an electronic display uh, system for, well, ostensibly books, but PDFs, text files, HTML files, things like that. Um, it uses a special type of screen that isn't the standard backlit screen that you might get on a phone or a laptop. It uses e-paper. Um, yes, so that has two special properties. One is that it, it isn't backlit. You can use it using natural light, so therefore it's more comfortable on your eyes. Um, and the other one is that it doesn't use any power um, when it's just displaying the same page. It's only when you're changing a page or it has to redraw the uh, screen and expend energy. So you would summarise it to be a, a turbo-powered Etch-a-Sketch? Uh, actually, that's not a bad comparison. Um, you haven't got quite as many buttons to twiddle on the front as the Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> Alan's shaking it now to see if it makes the page clear. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, but yes, yeah, so it's a very similar screen in some ways. It feels quite similar, but it's very clear. And it's got a high resolution on it, so you know, it, does, uh, it is easy to read, even at sort of quite small font sizes. But yeah, so that's what an ebook and reader from, is, and from any angle, really. Yes, it's not like a, like an LCD on a laptop where you could, you know. Yeah, you can read it almost sort of. Well, you can see the characters almost kind of edge on. Yeah, um, if I re- 
<laughs> if, if I really wanted, wanted to hold, hold it, it edge on, parallel, then yes, I could. Yeah, so that would be mental, parallel though. or perpendicular to your face. Yes, yes, you could hold it like that. Um, yes. So, so um, how how much time have you spent reading on it? I've read uh, about three different books on there. They very kindly gave me a book on it, um, which was the Dan Brown, the latest Dan Brown, the, the Lost Symbol. Anyway, mm-hmm. sounds um, riveting. Yeah, and that was, was provided in EPUB format, which is the um, oh, yes, yes, which is one of the many formats it does support, but it's the one that supports DRM. So they sort of had loaded that on for me, so I'd have something to read when I got it out of the box. Um, and I've also been able to put on some non drm works, a um, copy of Art of Community by John Who? O'Bacon. Who? Which, yeah, I don't know. Um, and some text files from Project Gutenberg, um, so some Sherlock Holmes and things like that on there. And how did you put those onto it? I noticed it's got, a, it's got an SD slot, and mm-hmm. which is SDHC. Yes. And it's got a USB B, small mini USB B on the bottom. Yeah, it charges, and you can transfer data onto it using the USB socket. Um, so I just transfer them over that. It's got one gig of built-in storage. What which, do you do? Just drag and drop. Yeah. So it's, it's like a mass storage device. It is a mass you just storage. Connect, and you see it as a drive on your computer. Do you? Yep. It just pops up on. I tried it on Ubuntu, and it just popped up, and just literally click and drag the file. Or if you're downloading it, download it straight into the right directory. And did you try any other software, or was that the only thing you did? That was basically the only thing that I I did in terms to get to get books on there. The, the downside for Linux users is that the the bit of software that you you should use to put the EPUB DRM material on there is Adobe Air based. Adobe were going to make a Linux version, said they were going to, and then decided not to. Handy. So you're sort of a little bit up the creek if you want to put DRM to books. Can't you use um, Calibra or one of the other... There are tools for converting between different formats, but I've not right. really tried to get to grips with those. Okay. Um, but yes, it was. It's uh, in terms of putting on the free work, the unencrypted, the, the undrm'd work, it was very straightforward, very easy. So you said it doesn't use any power whilst it's actually running. So so you can see words on it at the moment, yep. and that's using no power at all. Apparently so, yeah. So presumably you measure the power consumption in page turns. Yes. So do you know how many page turns you can get out of a chart fully charged? Uh, I have seen the statistic, and off the top of my head I can't remember what it is, but they reckon it's probably long enough for a, you know, a good uh, sort of holiday. You take it away without so, to recharge So it you could right. read a whole book of a normal size oh oh yeah absolutely yeah i mean you're probably multiple talking books, yeah right? you're talking multiple books that you could read um and again it depends how many pages are in a book of course yeah yeah <laughs> if it's run spot run you're probably all right to read that quite a few times <laughs> well, i don't know well, yeah but yeah. Yeah, the interesting thing is from what i'm seeing it is it only black and white or yes just... i think all the e-paper stuff's only black and white i've not seen any mm-hmm. color ones yet not yet um when you said you put um files on it you put um text files and pdfs and stuff yep. did you have any issues with formatting did it just look right or did it fonts and you know wacky symbols and stuff it's quite inter- it's quite interesting um the html versions tended to crash it nice Ooh. yes which i'm not quite sure why um it tries to work out the formatting data and and just render it as a page one of the advantages of an ebook reader is you can increase and decrease the, the size of the font um, to a comfortable reading size for your eyes, which obviously you can't do in a book other than move it further or closer away from from your <laughs> eyes. Um, so in the EPUB format, it's able to work out the font sizes and reflow it and uh, work out relative sizes of fonts for headings and things like that. It's obviously a bit more tricky to do with HTML because it has to work out what is and isn't displayed and stuff. Um, See, I thought EPUB was like an encapsulated HTML thing. I think it's XML-based. But oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, but it obviously knows how to, to read that format, and they've obviously spent more time fixing the bugs in mm. that format. Um, so, yeah, it was a little bit crashy when it came to uh, HTML. PDF is a bit more difficult, again, because um, I think it can do some reflowing, but essentially you're looking at almost an image of a page on a screen. You can zoom in and stuff, though. Okay. So you've actually read a book from start to end using that? I've read about yeah, about three books, yeah. And are you a, would you consider yourself to be a, a traditional book reader as well? Um, yes, in, in what way? So, so do, untraditional, uh, I mean, reading do on my you, head. Do, or... do you regularly read paper-based novels? Yeah, usually, yeah. So how would you compare the experience between reading a traditional book to reading an electronic book? That's a very, very good question. Um, in many ways, it's easier because it's smaller uh, but it's about the same size as a paperback it's a bit thinner usually it's certainly lighter than a, than a book so it's easier on your sort of wrist if you're reading in bed or whatever um the screen isn't as big as an actual page of a of a novel and so um i found to have it a comfortable size for my eyesight 
um, reading was meaning I was going through quite a lot of page turns, more than I would have done if it was a novel. So that gets a little bit tiring because you kind of have your thumb on the button for the next page all the which, time. Which I noticed is worn out. Yes, that did wear off really quite quickly uh, in the course of sort of one book. Uh, that down button, uh, down page button uh, wore off. The, the printing on it still works and everything. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of not not ideal that, I guess. And it comes with three different fonts, Georgia, Courier, and NTX New. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Well, well I'm just mucking about I'm with mucking it around with just... And I've tried, um, I I just took um, a bunch of e-books that I had on my laptop, put them on an SD card. Oh, wicked. Hoping it would work and just stuck that in the machine and it just found them straight away. And right now I'm reading uh, a PDF of Dive Into Python. Sorry, did nice. you say SD or SDHC? It's SDHC. Oh, so that's the high capacity ones? Yes, yeah, so 8 gig. Ah. One of the nice things about it is that it also has an MP3 player built Ooh. in or mp3 playing functionality now presumably when you're using that it is make it, it is using a battery yeah. all the time so it is going to run it down but i like the idea of you know being able to read a book you know sat on a beach with some music on with the headphones it sounds Will quite it, nice does it come with a bar and a drink and <laughs> yeah if only not quite everything does it play ogs i i haven't tried because there's a there's a wrinkle i don't think it does but there's a wrinkle in that the jack for the headphones See on the bottom there? Oh, yeah. Nice and Tiny. nice and convenient. Yeah, it's a two point five mil jack, oh, not I the standard three point five mil jacks. Now they, they do normally supply an adapter, but it wasn't in this review unit, okay. so I haven't. And bizarrely, I haven't got one considering the amount of audio kit I've got kicking around here. I couldn't find an adapter to try it with. See, I, I recently read um, a, a novel from start to finish on my on my Android phone. All oh, right, okay. And uh, and I had to go through the dance of converting it from PDF to EPUB, right? And and that and that seemed to work quite well. One of the things I really liked about the phone size is the fact that it was always with me. So if I'm waiting outside yeah. the school and things like that, I just reach into my pocket and I can read a few pages. And I found I got through the book much faster. The trouble is with that size, it's slightly too big to go in your pocket. Yeah, it would fit in a handbag. But, yes, but it wouldn't fit in a box, and that's one thing I find a bit of a limitation is the is the actual size. Yeah, I mean there are people who stuff paperbacks in their coat pocket or whatever when they're going on a, on a journey. It is about the same size, maybe slightly larger than a, than a paperback in terms of its sort of um, yeah. width and height. Um, I did sort of stick it in the bags when we were going away for a, a weekend or whatever, and it was it was fine to do that. And even if we were going out for the day, and you're taking a bag, I was taking my camera bag with me, so it was easy to slot into that. If I was just going out with nothing else, then yeah, maybe a bit too big to fit in the pocket. The last time I used an electronic reading device for for reading an entire book was um, when my daughter was very, um, very, very young, and um, she didn't sleep very well, so we used to rock her backwards and forwards. And I would stand in her bedroom and go insane walking backwards and forwards in her in her bedroom. <laughs> yes. I used to have a Palm PDA, and I would have books on there in PDB format and sit there and page down, page down, page down. Now. The beauty of that is uh, Palm PDA has got a backlight and a phone has a backlight, but this thing doesn't. No. So you're kind of scuppered in the dark, aren't you? So there's a, a slight limitation that if you're in bed, you've got to get a reading light. Yeah. It's the same as well, you, with a on, normal book. As, hang yeah. on, something I will say. With my phone, um, what I did was when I was in bed reading is I actually inverted the colours. So the black round was black and the whiting was right, was white. And I actually found that much easier yeah. on the eyes. Yeah, but um, what I'm talking about is if you have yes. no light. But if it, I wonder if it was pitch black, would that actually show up? You wouldn't get an, enough. Nothing. You you would see no. nothing. In it, it. There's, there's no backlight in there at all. There's no tubes behind the screen. See, when, when we were in uh, UDS in America, we went through and we looked at quite a few of these things, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, one no. of them did have a backlight, the Sony one, mm. and it. The backlight seemed a bit naff, didn't it? It was like it a little. Yeah. It, it was like a, a, a an eighties Casio um, watch where you yeah. press it and the light mm. comes out the side. Yeah, and I thought they could have done a better job there. Well, it, it's they've never had them before. It's only really now, just now, they're coming to market with any sort of lighting on them. Um, and they and like anything, they're getting smaller. Um, the screens are getting a bit bigger. You know, the amount of sort of uh, bezel and things around them is, is decreasing. Um, but the uh, the things that the Sony's and the Kindles of this world do that these things don't is they have Wi-Fi built in, they have like QWERTY keyboards on them. And for me, that feels philosophically wrong. I don't want to be looking at something thinking essentially it's a computer. Mm. I don't want to browse the web when I'm reading a book. I've got netbooks and stuff for that. I want to read a book. So I don't want to be tempted almost. However, one thing I will say about the Kindle is there was a recent controversy about the copyright of a certain, I think it was, a, uh, was it... 
Um, oh. It was in 1984. It was George yes, Orwell yes. thing, yeah. Where it's out of copyright in this country, isn't it, or something? Yeah, it was a bit of a kerfuffle when they and, ended up pulling yeah, it. Pulled yeah, it. and Amazon deleted it off everyone's unit. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, the fact having a, a, a basically a bookshop reach in and delete things from your home, you yeah. know, I mean, I guess they couldn't do that with this with this yeah. sort of technology. Mm. But then it is again a lot cheaper than things like the Kindle mm. and, and the. So you've read a few books, yeah. And um, this is the first ebook reader you've tried, yeah. And you've had not specific to this device. Do you like the experience of using an ebook reader? Uh, yes. Okay. So would you consider buying if you had that disposable income? Would you consider buying an ebook reader? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I could get a wider range of novels. Well, yes, actually, as a technology piece, I'm I'm quite happy with you know the concept of an ebook reader, and I like the practice of it. As a, a Linux user, I'd want to be able to go and get pretty much you know any novel and stick it on there. Because mm-hmm. I mean, that actually brings me to the question I was going to ask: um, Where do you actually get your content? Because I, I'm I'm aware there's probably um, less legitimate ways of receiving these books. Yeah, but is there a like a bookstore where you can easily buy MP3, uh, easily buy PDFs. Yeah, I think Amazon sells some, and the the people of the cooler, the people who make that run a, a, an online shop, there where are you can a buy few. them as well. Yeah. There are a few, yeah. but of course, it's not every book. Not every publisher has the agreement in place or has the the money to expend on producing the mm. EPUB version of their book, and the EPUB version costs just about the same as the paper book. Um, now I've got some books upstairs and things that are academic books and things that I'm reading for my coursework and science fiction books and things which aren't produced in EPUB versions. So I've no choice but to use the paper version as well. The the, the thing that really bugs me was recently there was a book that came out in America first and I thought, oh, I'll get it on release date in electronic format. And it was in hardback and it was about £16 or something like that. Mm. And they were charging the same price for the electronic version. I'm thinking, well, you know... You actually want something a bit more yeah. for your money, don't you? One of the things we've... Extras. Book we've, extras. <laughs> as we've um, moved from... I, th- I think there's an analogy here between moving from um, vinyl and compact discs to MP3 and OG players, um, yeah. similarly moving from you know analogue books to moving to something like this. The, thing, the benefit of having a collection of stuff in CD format is you can rip it to yeah. MP3 or FLAC or OG or whatever. You can't rip your books into no, unless you ebook had, format unless no, you had true. a particularly boring sunday afternoon yeah. or, well, with the scanner. Yeah. or you outsource it to you know yeah uh, no, that's, that's a very good point and, and when you have a cd you own the thing you've got the artwork you've got the sleeve notes you've got yeah you know much more surrounding whereas you don't get decent artwork and things yeah. with an ebook see at the moment i'm in the middle of ripping all my music and putting them putting the cds away in a box right. and filing it away there's no way for me to rip all my books. And no. So I'd have to go out and buy them all over again or use questionable moral per- yeah. ways of getting hold of them and saying, well, I already paid for it once. I think I should have a copy of the electronic version or whatever. And that's if they've made an e-version at all. Yeah, absolutely. So so if you could get the books mm-hmm. and um, the books are available and you could get them for a reasonable price, you think you probably would get an e-book reader? Yes. Would this be on the list of ones you'd consider? Uh, it depends how much cash I would have. I mean, if I was really looking for something that was just cheap and did the job, then yes. Um, I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that another reviewer might have taken the screws out at some point <laughs> and not put them back properly. Um, well, we would have. <laughs> well, yeah. well, yeah, to be honest, I haven't dismantled it myself. I mean, I like the style of it, and, and aesthetically it's very, very pleasing. Even the fact that it's pink. Uh, apart from the pinkness, well, you know... I, I assume know, it's available I'm, in other colours. It is available in other colours. lots of colours, actually. But I am comfortable enough with my masculinity that I could pull off a, a pink ebook reader on a train if I needed really? to. Yeah. <laughs> really? um, absolutely. No, but the, what I do like about it is that there aren't many controls. One of the things that I, I said before I don't like about the uh, Kindle and the Sony ones is they've got so many controls over the thing that it feels much more like a gadget than a book. Yeah. yeah. Whereas this has got a, almost an iPod-like wheel on the front of it mm. and just sort of four little buttons uh, along the side. And that was one of the things that really did appeal yeah, it's, about it's, it. It's not bad. It's not a bad little device. No. One, one thing that particularly appealed to me to reading an electronic book is I'm always losing the bookmarks. Now, doing it electronically presumably has like a bookmark function. It's funny you should say that. I, this this PDF dive into Python. I just was testing out the buttons, and one of them took me out of the book. So I went back in again, and it took me straight to the start, not to where I was in the book just now. Yeah, you can navigate to a specific page, but it's a little bit clunky to do that uh, unless you happen to know the number. And even then, you have to enter the number via a, a jog wheel almost. Well, actually, if you hold down the page up 
it, it whizzes through them really quickly. Oh, right. Well, there you go. Which I just discovered <laughs> <laughs> by holding the button down. Well, there we go. Um, um, but well, again, you've got to know the page number in order to know where you're headed to. Yes. I guess you could just take your finger off and see where you land. But One other thing. I mean, presumably this is quite an early device. Um, so is it possible to update the software or firmware actually on the unit? Yes, yeah, so I believe, yes. In fact, there is a slightly newer version of the firmware out than is shipped with that. But it's a, uh, guess what? Windows only upgrade installed no. for the firmware, unfortunately. It's just a mass storage device and they give you a Windows updater for it. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh. I mean it'll just be a firmware file on the file on the um file system. on the file system, but it's incorporated in the, with an installer and application mm. and stuff, which is Windows only. Oh, and of course okay. Wine doesn't do USB, so Yeah. Well, it might might be interesting to ask them, um, because a lot of these are actually our Linux based as well, so we might be able to get the source. Yeah, this it. thing runs Linux, doesn't it? Uh pass it might do. I yeah, don't know. I have, I have a feeling it does. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's 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 to be fair. It doesn't say it support. It says it support. It doesn't say that it supports Linux. But we did email saying, look, you know, we want to try out, see how compatible it is with Linux, and they were kind enough to give us a go. So, do you think you're ready to give it a score? At five. At five, I I'm sort of torn between three and four. So three and a half out of what, five. What would make it a four? Um, right size jack for headphones so I wouldn't have to carry an adapter on holiday Mm -hmm. slightly less crashing on the HTML and text version of files um, and uh, all the screws in the back of it (laughs) I don't know Um, yeah a little bit of a little bit increase in build quality not a huge amount because we don't want to weigh it down anymore but just something so it feels a little bit more sturdy and um, you're going to write up your um, your review and we'll put a link to it in the show notes yes it'll be published by the time the episode's out cool We've got some news this week. Have Ooh. we? Mm. The GNOME or GNOME Foundation has received a check for six hundred and fourteen dollars and twenty cents from Magnitune, a dividend for their close integration of Rhythmbox with the Open Music Store. Canonical have also received a check for an undisclosed amount, estimated to be in the region of around a hundred dollars, for albums purchased through Rhythmbox on Ubuntu. Well, that's the Canonical Christmas party covered there. Absolutely, they're in bucks. profit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, well, so what are they going to do with that hundred dollars? Roughly estimated hundred dollars. Um, pay for Jono's beard trims. Mm. Pay, like for, pay for some metal. Yes. I wonder how many albums they would have to sell in order to keep um, Ubuntu in profit. Mm. See, actually, with that money, they could reintroduce ship it. Actually, yeah, hundred dollars. Yeah, I think you'd have to get in there quick, <laughs> <laughs> or you could just have one big order. Microsoft has added Japanese manufacturer IOData to their list of corporate scalps who have signed a patent agreement. Microsoft have also struck a similar deal with Amazon, who joined the likes of Samsung, LG, Kyocera, Xerox, Brother and TomTom. Yeah, that thing doesn't actually say what they've signed an agreement with Amazon for. It's all very secret and hush-hush, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, it says technology in the Kindle and in their back-end servers, but it doesn't say exactly what technology. No, I mean, it's probably FAT32 on the Kindle. Mm, could be because that's patented. Well, it? why would they actually? Uh, but the thing is, there is a use license for the Fat Thirty Two that's published, isn't there? Oh, it's Fat Sixteen. Sorry, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But surely, won't they just change it? Mm. 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 It's not like it's an open device, is it? The Perl script, which gained worldwide fame for helping people download non-DRM versions of BBC program from its iPlayer site, has been dropped. The author feels that the BBC's recent actions to increase the copy protection on iPlayer has effectively made his position untenable. It's a real shame. Yeah. For those people who don't know, it's a a little script that runs on basically any platform and it uses um, various open source tools to download and stream content from the BBC's website uh, to your machine. So Mm. Linux users tend to use it as a way of downloading stuff so they don't need Flash. Yes. And um, it works really, really well. But also, if you wanted to, you could keep the recordings. Yeah, I mean, it does. For longer it does, than the seven days, the flash version. Uh, yeah, it does by default prompt you and say, you know, you, you should get rid of these after 30 days, but you can say no. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, you could circumvent the law in the same way that you could break the law with uh, a hammer. Law yes. or license. Yeah, well, license, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Terms and conditions under which the media yeah. is distributed. But yeah, Phil, the guy who wrote it, has decided to drop support, which is a shame. Which is unfortunate because um, about 24 hours before he announced this, uh, well, there was two aspects. One, I, I uploaded his or had his patch sponsored for the Karmic version, 
yeah and I'm waiting for that to go live and I'm thinking okay to, I've just done this it would have been nice to know to put it into the repository yes right and I'm thinking ah oh. and then also I'm working with with some of the Myth TV upstream guys to try and get it um, support and I was saying well actually you could use this script that does all the work for yeah. you yeah and then they come back to me and said uh, actually about an hour ago you announced this yeah well it looks like other people are forking it and um, going to continue to try to maintain it Rumours are rife that the company behind the SUSE Linux distro will be broken up if it's taken over by an investment group, Elliot. Although they've officially denied, reports suggest that the legacy network operating system will be flogged off, as will SUSE Linux. Boo. Yeah, sad trombone. Yeah, I mean, SUSE have been very innovative in its time, and, and mm. the other companies that Novell purchased um, have a really sort of, you know, de- developed Mono, and they've put a lot of the bling into the desktop. And yeah, there's stuff. like the, originally the, um, the whole... Uh, Zimian the um, 3D desktopy stuff mm. effects came out of Novell out of nowhere yeah. along and they did um, Evolution Mail Client yep uh, iFolder yep yes what else um, the uh, uh, Hula the Mail Client Bongo oh yes yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah but, yes. um, that's quite a lot really yeah but, that's enough yeah. but actually also Novell were probably the leading uh, Linux desktop to actually integrate um, network wide services as well I mean mm. for yes. example a lot of schools and university if they're going to have Linux they, 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 there's a good chance they're running that mm. and also in the corporate environment if you know in, in my day job we use um, SAP and th- th- I think there's only a very limited number of um, platforms that that's supported on one's Red Hat and one's SUSE mm. but to be honest if it did go away it wouldn't be the end of the world because then green becomes available for other distributions to use like, Linux Mint have already got it oh, the- <laughs> <laughs> but the point is it's not necessarily going away it's just going to be sold off to another company whether that company has got the resources to continue to allow it to develop the innovative ideas it has done in the past mm. is a different question if you're a betting man what would you bet on? Uh, a horse <laughs> <laughs> The company for whom data is everything, Google, have made street-level images of 95% of the UK available online. Street view photos, taken from a touring car with a roof-mounted camera, often produce concerns over privacy amidst the tittering about people caught short in shop doorways. Is your house on it, Alan? Yes. Is yours, Dave? Um, Yes and no. Yes, it is, but no, you can't get to it because my road isn't yet mapped. and Therefore, you can't get to the pictures because the map doesn't exist. But the, the pictures are taken. You can get to one end of my road and one end at the other end. But because you can't navigate using Google Maps to get there. And that's all we've got time for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a actually, simple no actually, would have done. <laughs> <laughs> so the first event is the Southeast Linux Fest. It's on June the 11th, 12th and 13th. And the fine people have given us a promo to play. Join us for the 2010 Southeast Linux Fest as we once again celebrate Linux and open source software in the GNU slash South. Due to the overwhelming response last year, this year's event will be bigger, better, and longer. Self 2010 will take place Friday, June 11th through Sunday, June 13th at the Spartanburg Marriott at Renaissance Park in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Be there for UbuCon, Fedora Activity Day, BSDA certification, Drupal Camp, multiple parties featuring Dual Core as well as the guys from Mystery Science Theater 3000 as Rift Tracks, and an even more expansive group of superb speakers, sponsors, and exhibitors. Self is free to attend, but hurry and register today to lock in the special discount room rate at the hotel. Register today at southeastlinuxfest.org. So you can find more information at southeastlinuxfest.org. EuroPython is happening again this year uh, on July the 19th to the 24th in Birmingham, UK. And Alex Wilmer wrote in to tell us that this is the last year it will be held in the UK. And 2009 was the largest open source conference in the UK and one of the largest community organised software conferences in Europe. Registration is now open. The cheaper early bird rates run until the 10th of May, so get in early. The Call for Papers is also open and they have facilities for projects that would like to run sprints before and after the main conference. Find out more at europython.eu. So the event that everybody is really talking about is Og Camp 10, which is now, as we're recording, only seven weeks away, I think. Oh, crikey. It's getting closer, everybody. Have we booked our hotels? I've booked mine. Mm. Tony, have you booked mine? No. Dave, have you booked mine? No. Nah. I think you're all sharing with Simon. Um... So it's at the Blackie in Liverpool 
all the way up north for those of us who are in the south, but it'll be fine. Um, the sponsors for the event, who are very kindly uh, donating us money or resources or something like that, are... Linux Format, who are our media partner. Thank you. The Open Learning Centre. The Linux Emporium. Ops View. And Bitfolk. So go and buy the relevant services and products from those good people. Because <laughs> they are brilliant. I'm trying to remember what they all do, but yeah, they all do lots of really good well, stuff. Whatever it is, it's whatever very, it is. very good. It's, they, they, they all are involved in open source in one way or another. They're yeah, clearly so. highly profitable because they're wasting <laughs> their money on us. Wasting? <laughs> well, investment. investment. Sorry, investment. Sorry, invest, invest. Investment. I always get those around the wrong way. I know um, Andy Smith from Bitfolk um, actually is sort of saying to a lot of his customers, if you're coming along, you know, say hello and we'll buy you a beer. Or whatever, so... Um, Excellent. Or so drink, hang on, do you, know, do you know how much his cheapest package is? Because is it worth becoming a customer just, just to, to get, get a free drink beer? Out it might well be, yeah. <laughs> um, and on the Friday night beforehand, we've got the Rat Hole Road Show, which is a special free culture gig um, in Liverpool again the night before. So you can check out the uh, Odd Camp website and find out more about that. Should be good fun. My tickets arrived last week. Oh, really? So really good, yeah. Tickets for Odd Camp? Tickets for, no, tickets for the Rat Hole Roadshow. Odd Camp is not a ticketed event at this point. Right. Oh, so you do need a ticket for the Rat Hole thing? For mm-hmm. the Roadshow, yes. Yeah, uh, do you not read your mail? <laughs> Clearly not. Um, but yes, we had a few volunteers for crew, but more are always welcome. So you can email ogcamp at ubuntu-uk.org if you want to volunteer to be on the crew. We'll pass your name along. There's a Facebook fan page. If you are on Facebook and want to express to your friends and family that you are coming to Og Camp, then you can say so on the uh, Facebook event. And in fact, invite anybody along who you think might be interested in coming as well. And if you don't want to let your friends and family know, mm-hmm. you can sign up with a, a separate Facebook yes, account. Create a separate Facebook account. Just, so just so that we know how many people are likely to be coming. Yeah, it does help. It helps us gauge the number of drinks and stuff we need to provide. Um, and we're looking at the moment for... Um, Rapple prizes and things like that. We've got some Viglin NPCLs, um, but we're also sort of sorting out the merchandise. Dave's on the case. With I am on the case. Cool. So we'll have some mugs and things again this year. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're really looking forward to it, mm. and it's going to be good. We're going to do a live show again, a live recording. But it is two days, and so we're hoping to have a lot of good speakers coming along. So, you know, think about what you could do as a talk mm. and turn up and uh, sort of take part in the event. And it doesn't have to be necessarily technical. No, not at all. Do you have an idea for a talk, Tony? I'm hoping just to get through the weekend, basically. <laughs> Although, you know, I suppose I could bring a couple along just in case. A talk something like how not to get involved in organising events in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we do owe credit to Dan and Laura, um, yep. who are doing most of the legwork for this one. And Anna, who's organising the crew. Anna and Laura Chukoski as well, who's oh, yes, also helping course. out. So we have uh, sort of the crew has grown. All well, mm. the organisers has grown a bit, which is great. Um, so we're going to go so with does, other things. So does that mean our cut off profit gets smaller? Yes, it's profit. a very big profit making <laughs> event, Dave. Make sure you declare it on your cash return. We're lucky if we just cover our costs. But yes, come along. It's going to be really good fun. So now we've got our command line love. Unfortunately, our beloved Simon couldn't be with us this evening. So thankfully, Josh Holland one of our famous listeners, mm. has actually sent us a contribution. Excellent. He has, yeah. He writes, Bash stores your most recent commands as a command history. Most people are aware that being able to press the up and down arrow keys and control R to scan through this history, but there are a couple of other ways to use it too. You can type exclamation mark CP and Bash will repeat the last command that started with CP. As a special case, you can use two exclamation marks to repeat the last command and exclamation mark minus n to go back that number of lines you can also use a whole heap of other things to repeat the last command uh, with certain strings in it which i'm not going to read out but we'll put the notes on the website yeah that's really cool so yes i I always go up and down using the up and down keys but find myself going back sort of several commands sometimes i tend to find myself typing out the word history right if you if you ever look through my history you'll find lots of commands like ls and cd and then you'll find the word history history (laughs) history pipe grep Grep. (laughs) yeah exactly history pipe grep history but yeah. actually someone recently said to me they didn't like ubuntu and this is one of the, the the sole reason he actually said to me was because page up page down is not mounted to your history he said that really bugs him and wow. there is an option in your etc to change that mm. but he was saying that is the thing about ubuntu he doesn't like what so that instead of going up and down with the arrow you go up and down with the page up yeah. and down oh really what platform does that um <laughs> solaris oh. AIX or something <laughs> weird. there we go so thanks to that thanks to josh for that and uh, if you're a command line lover, then you can uh, find your way around your history much quicker now. We've got Ivanka Majic on the phone, who is um, Canonical's design team lead. 
I was responsible for the new look and feel of, of uh, the new Ubuntu uh, version. H- Hello, Ivanka. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good, good. Thank you for joining us on the phone. Pleasure. You've been causing quite a few headlines recently. Yes, we have. Especially <laughs> with buttons. <laughs> yes. What's the deal with the buttons? This is the first question that everybody wants to know right yes. now. What's um, going on? I think it's good if we, we get, get it out of the way. Um, the buttons have moved to the left for a variety of reasons. I noticed before I got on the on the uh, call um, that Mark had responded to the bug. So by beta one, we will decide if they stay in the LTS. As I've mentioned in blog posts and to various people who I've chatted to about it, the biggest concern, I think, is making a change like this in an LTS. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's simply, it's one of, I think that's the biggest con- biggest thing to worry about. I was thinking, I've been thinking, I knew I'd have to talk about it, and I've also obviously had to think through this before <laughs> writing my blog post. Mm. Um, to justify a design wholly and completely in a way that nobody will find a reason to object to it is quite hard, especially in writing. Um, I'm, con- I'm aware that that in itself sounds lame it sounds like a um sort of a oh to explain it all would be too Mm. hard and therefore we can't right um but there are a number of factors that we considered um some of them were in the bug and some of them mark has now mentioned in his in his response to the bug which is that you know we've got ideas for the future where you know having the buttons on the left gives us more room to play with that doesn't mean that putting the buttons on the left is the perfect solution. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to put it into an alpha so we could get it out there, get it tried out, and do some testing on it. I think the biggest mistake I've made, or the thing that I've learned, is that I need to get a lot better at communicating with the community. I, um, I, I, don't, think, I don't think you're alone in that one. Well, I think, but, you know, as, a sort of, as the design team lead... I think I should lead by example, really. Oh. Um, and I think that I need to. I need to get. I mean, we're we're, we're all we've launched straight into the buttons, and I, you know, I can't. Mm. I, I, I um, and I, I wonder if sort of understanding that there are thirteen of us, including me, and a project manager, and uh, the fact that the majority of people have been there under a year. You know, there's a lot to get used to, and there's a lot of work to do. So, so, so if you want to take a rewind and tell us about what you do and what your team does. Would that help? If I, do I want to do what, sorry? Uh, rewind from the buttons and, and tell us what your team does so, get, so people have a better understanding of what the design team does and how many of you are there and what you will work on. So I think, I think that might be useful because it sets a bit of context. Go but for we've it. Got, um, so within the team, the skills are basically, we have Charlene Poirier, who's an anthropologist, ethnographer, usability tester, um, she uh, is she is her sole responsibility is to bring us useful data. Um, she does that by doing usability testing, user research, so more ethnographic style. I don't know if anybody who was at UDS will have seen her um, the results of her diary study into how people see their social identities, um, and also wow. just trawling through academic papers and bringing us useful stuff. We have graphic designers. Um, Otto is the main graphic designer who works on the desktop. So mm. He's responsible for most of the theme work. Marcus works, has been working on the brand identity piece, and Dominic has been working on the web piece. So I know that with the brand identity announcement, there were elements of each of their, the, the work of each of them, because uh, the result of Marcus's work, most, most of it goes into marketing materials. And so he's done things like come up with, he did the koala t-shirt and the um, work on the lucid t-shirt. So um, that's where I think you'll have seen some of his work to date. Um, then we've got Dom, who's been doing the web work. Um, hopefully we'll all get to see that properly and in detail quite soon. And then we've got uh, user experience people, so interface design, um, interaction designers, user experience designers, web and desktop. MPT you'll be very familiar with. <laughs> yep. Yep. David Siegel you'll know um, from Gnome Do mostly. And, um, and then we've got John Lee who does a lot of work uh, on Ubuntu One really at the moment. And um, then I think actually... 
actually, I haven't named everybody, but that's, that's about it. We've got Alejandra who works, she does user experience on the web. But we're basically a, a mix of skills, so not everybody does everything. We've tried to assign people, um, so for example, um, I don't know, MPT would not never be made responsible for drawing an icon. Right. We <laughs> don't leave it to Otto to decide how interactions happen on the on the on the desktop. So we we try and make sure that we we have the a sort of a, a, a pairing of graphic visual designer with user experience designer on on the elements that we work on. So, um, God, sorry, I was just going to say. So so all of these things that you're working on, is there a sort of a, a, a mission for the for your team as a whole? Is there a, a sort of one overriding uh, objective? Well. I overriding objective is to make Ubuntu more um, usable for more people. So um, I know going back to the to the buttons, gconf settings have been used as well as, oh, you know, you can change your gconf settings. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not the, the audience who understands what gconf settings are mm. and not really the audience I'm designing for. Fair enough. Um, the, I'm designing more for my brother who sneakily went off and had Windows put back on his laptop after I'd put Ubuntu on it because he couldn't get his iPod to work and he hid it from me for three weeks. <laughs> That's funny. My brother did the know. same thing. Sorry? My brother did the same thing. So, you know, it's that that I want to stop. I want to be able to go, I work on Ubuntu and people go, wow, Ubuntu, isn't it amazing? I can do all these things. Um, yeah, my, so, so that's really, you know, it's our, our job to help, to help take some already brilliant work. I mean, I use Ubuntu all day, every day to do everything. I noticed in the uh, Twitter stream there were some questions about, ask your manga if she uses a Mac. <laughs> yes. um, I'm not a graphic designer. I don't have 20 years of, of Photoshop uh, knowledge behind me, um, though I confess I'm still better with Photoshop than I am with GIMP. <laughs> um, but I do use Ubuntu all day long and... Um, so, because I also think for user experience work for wireframing, it's a lot easier than if you're a graphic designer. So, um, is that is that you say you, know, you use Ubuntu twenty four seven? Well, maybe not twenty four seven, but no. yeah, most of the time. W- would that be true for for most of the team? Um, for the team, the parts of the team who are, if you're uh, for everybody except if they're doing actual Photoshop work. Right. If there's somebody, I was talking about, because I noticed that question um, popped up somewhere as well. I think, you know, we've got, um, let's take Marcus, we'll pick on him. Mm. I like to pick on him. He's <laughs> grown, grown up enough to be able to take it. But he's been using Photoshop for, whatever, 15, 20 years. Mm. It's, I, if, I then, if I had to retrain him to use, an op- you know, it's just not worth the, worth the hassle. So, you know, it sounds, sounds like really... Yeah, just, you know, it's just a lot of effort would be involved retraining him in a different tool, um, but for IRC, email, document writing, all those things that you can do very straightforwardly in Ubuntu and all the open source packages that come with it, then yes, they use Ubuntu. So, what's your background then? How did you get into this role? Uh, I started out uh, quite a long time ago now um, as an electronic engineer. Uh, oh, I like wow. to write software. Um, in fact, I have written assembly code, and I oh. might see. Which processor? Sorry? <laughs> Which well, processor? Z80. Oh, awesome. My favorite. How old am I? <laughs> um, I'd say that puts you about 37. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling very <laughs> I, I would say about 26. Yeah, you would, yeah. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's how I started out. And then I realized that... Um, I was never going to be one of these super clever um, software development gurus because I like talking too much. (laughs) And I like developing... I enjoyed developing software that that I knew people could enjoy using. And also I hated doing technical support. Mm. Um, And then I worked out that there's this whole world that you can get into, um, this HCI world. So I basically... I did user research before I knew it existed as a, as a thing you could learn and do. Went off and did a master's and then shifted over into user experience um, design work and research. So um, I know some of the uh, conversations. I'll bring it back to the buttons just to help <laughs> everyone out here. Um, you know, I follow user-centered design practices. You know, I, I prefer every design decision to be made on the basis of some data. 
um, wherever possible. I think that testing with end users, observing them, watching them, trying to find out what people like to do helps us make better software. Um, and, you know, that's really how I ended up uh, on the design team. Because I don't know if you've come across Julian, who was mm. the head, the, the lead before me. He had been my client in my job before last. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> small so world. I'd worked with him designing a mobile phone. Um, hadn't worked with him since. It wasn't then, the Open Moco, was it? Sorry? It wasn't the Open Moco, was it? No. Oh, good, good. That's all right then. That's fine. Um, thank you. So uh, then, you know, so, so uh, I hadn't worked with him since. Then he got the job at uh, Canonical and uh, wanted me to come along and join him. So that's how I ended up here. I think for... For me personally, uh, just speaking for myself, working on, I've been a, a, a consumer of open source software for many years, so, but I've never contributed. Uh, I got put off uh, when I was a young student because um, uh, it's, it's a vocal online world, the open source world. <laughs> yep. and, You've discovered that. <laughs> uh, I think for sort of, I think I'm old enough now to be able to cope with it. <laughs> But uh, I certainly couldn't in my early 20s. So, um, so yeah, so I've been a, a long-time consumer, so I thought it was time to come and give something back. And I was looking for a job where I could actually make all, my ba- all, my, all the work I've done till now has been at agencies, so it's been on projects. And they may have lasted up to a year, but there's only so much ownership and investment you can have with a project if you're the external agency. So, 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 so you mentioned that you use lots of data, yeah. Um, so you said that, I mean, presumably a lot of that is public, but uh, what, what's your team actually been doing to uh, pull in um, extra data to actually come to these design decisions? Um, well, we've done, um, when I first joined, we did about 36 new user interviews. So um, I had uh, sort of just, I ran one hour sessions with people who'd never used Ubuntu before. So I'd give them a theme. For example, you've got people to bring in their MP3 players and then, Uh you know, had a CD, had some music already on the machine and did a music in Ubuntu. Um, Not being able to use your iTunes library in uh, Ubuntu is a bit of a showstopper. Um, Then then we did photos and we did um, chats um, and we did sort of various themes um, with different age groups. Uh, so, and that's really what the Paper Cuts project started from. All right. Yeah. Because, um, you know, fundamentally, Ubuntu works. I would argue that a whole bunch of people, and works very well, or work, you can work and be productive on the Ubuntu platform. I would argue that most people who do use it know somebody who's a little bit more technical than them or are themselves a technical person because it's fine until something goes a bit wrong and then it's a bit weird and you need to open the terminal you need to know what gconf settings are mm-hmm. and you need to um so so we had so the, the the paper cut project sort of started from that well let's fix up a whole bunch of little things that people keep stumbling across um, then we've run subsequent to that we've done a lot of testing um, so uh, Alejandra who's been working on the new website has run a couple of rounds of testing wireframes for the websites um, because the other thing we've realised is that unless somebody tells you what Ubuntu is it's very hard just by reading um, to actually work out what it is so if you put people in front of the current home page they can spend quite a lot of time clicking around without really understanding that Ubuntu is an operating system. It sounds very obvious. Yeah. Um, and that you know, people treat the download as if, it, if they're downloading a plug-in for Firefox, for example, or a little application that they're going to run. Yeah. So I think you know, the, 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 the mental models for people and their operating systems, you know, they... they uh, they don't. We're, we're not. We're not supporting the way people think when we look at the at the current current website. This, this kind of reflects on something we discussed a little while ago. The um, the read write web article. I don't know if you saw it. Where um, a load of users googled for the the word Facebook dot com, and they got taken to an article on a completely different website that was um, a, a news article about Facebook, yeah. and and because they they just expected to be taken to Facebook. They they just thought that was Facebook and they tried to log in and, and use it. And I think we as technical people don't realise just how 
differently in inverted commas normal people see the internet and and our website like i i would have no problem saying go to our website and press download but it's clearly not that easy no <laughs> and we even got people going cds cds are so outdated where am i going to get a cd from to burn a cd now i'm going to have to go to the shop and it's going to be a you know there's there's a it's quite it's, it's so easy to forget what it was like not to know Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a, it, it, it's, it's a, um, and, and explaining it is not, it's not that straightforward. Mm. I'm afraid it, it, it beats my copywriting skills. But. One of the, um, one of the questions we have is, um, you mentioned about um, the, the size and scope of your team. Yeah. And what areas and aspects of Ubuntu, the desktop and the website and so on that you, you are able, you want to change um, yeah. for whatever reason. Now, some of them are going to be pretty straightforward for you to change. You have access to the web servers. You can change the website. What about desktop components where there's a lot of upstream projects such as, you know, the Evolution Mail, the yeah. GNOME panel and, and all the other areas that you want to make changes that maybe take us in a d- different direction or a slightly different direction than those upstream projects how do we how do we resolve that well partly i think it's a communications thing you know we've up until now so you know, I've, I've been here i think it was a year on the 6th of march so it's just a year hired a bunch of people done some stuff done the identity busy busy now it's time to actually start going from how do we work inside canonical to how do we work everywhere and working more openly will help i think um but also part of our remit is to work with upstream so for example one piece of work that charlene has done is she's done some research with the empathy guy so she did some research on the version of empathy we ship in ubuntu the usability testing and um the version the, the sort of pure empathy version um, and then brought the uh, test results, usability test results, to the dev team as part of uh, a project she's working on. Is working out how, if we do these usability tests and get this data and even have design recommendations, how do we communicate those in a way that's useful, actionable, that it gets um, I, at least considered seriously, if not implemented? Um, and because we can keep, because one of one of the answers is all file a bug. Well, it's not always a bug, and sometimes it needs, there needs to be a conversation around it. We can make a recommendation as a design team, but coming up with the correct solution is a conversation between developers and designers. Because otherwise, you know, we can suggest something that would, yeah, that's a brilliant solution if we had ten years and a million developers. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that we we hope to do is get better at being useful. Okay, well, we, we said on Twitter and Identica that we were going to be interviewing you this evening, and we've had lots of, of feedback, some of which we've already talked about. Um, we've had some uh, feedback from Tim H1 saying that the new look is a great improvement, and it looks even better with Docky. I don't know if you're familiar with Docky. I am familiar with Docky. And he I've, asked, got, I've got David Siegel on my team. How I oh, of course, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> and he asked, is there any plans to incorporate it in the default install? Not that I know of at the moment. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and along that sort of that theme, um, Techno Viking, uh, as Mike Basinger says, that a lot of people are saying it, it, the new look is very Mac-like, although he doesn't see it himself. So, do you think that is uh, is a fair a fair comment? I don't. Okay, fair really? enough. Really, I really don't. See, I <laughs> I have a Mac, and yeah. I uh, for the last two releases, I've spotted so many features in Ubuntu that are creeping in. Well, maybe they're just design cues that Apple have got right, and we're just doing this. We've come up. to the same conclusion. I mean, we asked MPT when he was when he came down for an interview. Oh yeah, and he, I think he said, in order to overtake the competition, first you've got to catch them. Personally, I said, so one of those, one of the the, 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 the the Twitter question was, you know, what what OS is, you know, does Ivanka use a Mac? I have, a, I have a Mac, I have a PC, and I run Ubuntu day-to-day. I have to be familiar with those other operating systems, yeah, otherwise yeah. I can't do my job. Yeah. Number one. With the theme, not functionality, let's not talk about functionality for the moment, with the actual look and feel, with the theme, I believe that we went through a process and some effort to ensure that the theme itself was not 
you know, we kind of disassembled. We first of all went through, because we went through the brand identity project, the idea of looking at the Ubuntu values. Yeah. Then we looked at, you know, we, then we looked at the competition, what elements they use. We sort of deconstructed them. And then we, you know, based on all that sort of competitive research and at the direction given to us by um, basically the, the brand identity project carved out uh, the beginnings of a brand identity for Ubuntu. So, okay, without without wishing to labour the point, yeah. we have monochrome icons on the toolbar in the top right. Yeah. We have a user switcher applet that's the same as the Mac one. We've got a log on screen that's effectively the same as the Mac one. Even even the window adjusts in size the same as it does on OS X. Um, the background is purple. The space background on OS X is purple, or has purple elements in it. Um, <laughs> this is you not labouring the point, is well, it, Alan? <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm just saying I can see why people say it does. I don't really care. I mean, I've got an, I've got a Mac, so I, yeah, I, I quite like it. But does it work? I that's the question. Is well, it yeah. usable? Well, yeah, I, I, I suppose I've sort of. Um, uh, so the, I could have answered the question completely differently. See, I, this is where it's quite. quite um, I could have just said that if one pays attention to design, being compared to the people who are known for design is brilliant. Yeah. Well, yes. True. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I, um, you know, I have a choice of, you know, explaining some processes involving or kind of going, well, you know, if you're, if you just, I think that, they're, that, you know, that's it. If I'm happy to be compared to Mac. Why not? <laughs> they do design well. Now, we've got another question from uh, Meme Machine underscore IE. And he says, are there new look SVG templates available or, or vectors uh, so, the, so the locos, the community, can build their presence look online for that, such as web banners and such? If there, if there aren't, there, there should be and will be. <laughs> oh, I suppose <laughs> I that's... I think that's a... Um, if I, I can't answer exactly because I'm not, I've not been um, mm. managing the, you know, things getting dropped in the right places part of the process. Um, but uh, there will be as much as possible made available to people so that they can carve out their own identities and, you know, time and people on the on the design team to sort of help with any advice or um, direction if required and wanted. Um, earlier on, you, you mentioned that there was um, you're willing to accept that there possibly could have been better communication mm. uh, in the past. So looking to the future, maybe beyond 10.04, let's say 10.04 has dropped and it's a huge success and everybody uses it. What's the, what are you looking to do for 10.10? Maybe not the specifics, but what, what kind of ideas do you have in mind? What, what concepts do you have in mind for our next release? question um well what? what's we your have, five year plan oh, well <laughs> let me think in five years time i don't know i think I, I can't give you specifics because i genuinely can't think of something you know nice to anchor this conversation around i can tell you that we have to go into negotiation with the platform team now for the roadmap and sort of like um uh, actually uh, uh decide what we what we're allowed to to, to, to get in um, but we've got things like um, uh, I'm to, I'm genuinely I'm trying to think I'm getting tired. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot and ask you for specifics but you know do you have do you have um, do you have any ideas in your mind things that you would like to see ways in which you would like to see the desktop improve me personally yeah as a human being not yeah. one that necessarily yeah. has influence nobody else is listening thing. just you and me on the phone <laughs> What? And the millions of others. <laughs> yeah, and all our millions of listeners. I am... What would I like to see? I would like to see... See, it's not just Ubuntu, though. It's the, the app that we ship on it. I'd like to see... I'd, I'd just like to see... <laughs> I'd like to see a world where... No, I'd like to see <laughs> improvement in the way... We just get stuff done. A lot of things take a, take a long time. I think that, that we get better. We will get better ideas if we work more openly. I think the the thing that everybody is is 
uh, neglecting to comment on with this um, identity work rollout and the theme landing is that this theme has just been started, really. It's, you know, it's, it's happened. We've got it to a stage where we're very happy to ship it, and I'm very pleased with it. But there's so much more we can do if we've got, now that we can do things in the open and set out some of our de- ideas and actually get help with changing the theme engine, engine, amending it, fixing some bugs in compis, getting GTK to do bit. You know, with this, this, we have more flexibility than anybody else doing software development right now. We can actually look at some things and, you know, the changing buttons is, is disruptive to people. It is not intended to offend and upset people. But there, I think it's right that we have some disruption, have some good conversation about why it's good to push the limits a little bit. Because, you know, MPT may well think that we need to first join the competition, but we really can leave them behind. Yes, yeah. So, I sincerely hope so. Well, whilst on the convers- uh, whilst on that topic of talking about conversation and things like that, uh, I noticed in this time round, uh, you did um, rather than just dropping the theme on the entire community, that there, there, there was a bit of discussion and a bit of um, sort of, sort of warming some of the community first. So, the, for example, the community council and, and some of the other councils got the theme early, and you invited some really awesome people. You were um, one of them, weren't you? Oh, actually, yeah. I was. Yes, uh, we, we we came to your office, and uh, one of the people that asked one of the questions also as well. Um, and we came in and we talked about the direction. Now, um, how do you see this openness improving as releases go on? Well, first of all, look, I'm I'm, I'm having this conversation with you. Yeah, you're on one of the premier Ubuntu podcasts. One of? The (laughs) premier Ubuntu I mean, I think it's worth saying that you are on UK time zone, so presumably this is out of your normal working hours. This is way out of my normal working hours. It's like, this is well eating into my social life. Are we we undoing all the good work that Pilates session did earlier? (laughs) (laughs) But, um, so, the communication getting better. I think we've got to get better at putting stuff in front of everybody because I had this conversation with somebody internally um, on one of the project teams and if you put a half finished design in front of another designer they'll ask you some questions and they'll kind of go hmm have you thought about this oh no I hadn't thought about that that's right but and there's a little bit of a conversation something better comes out of it often and this is not a criticism it's just the way of the world people who are very good at development they have a sort of and MPT is going to laugh because I've, this is me quoting him. <laughs> There's this kind of high C thinking. It's a very highly critical way of thinking. So you, you look at something and go, yeah, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. That's completely wrong. <laughs> Let's talk about this thing that's completely wrong in a huge amount of detail. So for a designer, it's actually quite a scary world to put a design into or a half-finished design because in a face-to-face, you can sort of manage the, oh, this person's getting upset. How am I going to do it? Let me change the conversation. But... With, with in the in the online world and in our open source community, putting a design out there just for feedback, there's a big risk that it's first going to get beaten up and then fed back on. Mm. And I think part of it's you know us getting a, a bit better at asking the right questions, but also you know the people in the community who want to engage with us getting getting better at, at, at giving us constructive feedback. You know. We, Good luck with that. <laughs> Go on. Good luck with that. Well, you know, I mean, it's such an emotional thing. I was talking, I can't remember, I, was, I talk all the time, you'll notice it's very difficult to shut <laughs> me up. But, you know, it's with any identity work, with anything that's, you know, the, especially the, the, the visual design elements of design are, are there to create an emotional reaction. That's what they exist for. Beauty, you react to emotionally, or, or, or ugliness, you react to emotionally. So therefore, it's very difficult to have a very logical conversation, or very, you know, calm and collective. Hmm, have you thought about using a different hue of purple in this instance? Mm. You know, it doesn't work. So, you know, it's just, it's just that once somebody's written something down in a blog post, or, you know, well, it's there, it's there forever. Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> and it's a, the sort of... Sort of scariness about it that I, you know it's just uh, well it, it's worth saying that we've had um, some really positive feedback from our, our Twitter and Identica people as well um, particularly um, it's worth saying what W. Lichtenberg says which is he'd just like to congratulate you and your team on the cool new looks of, of Ubuntu so it's um, 
it's certainly something that's causing a lot of debate, but there's a lot of positive feedback yeah. as well. It's not right. all doom and gloom. Well, no. Thank um, you very much to everybody. And people can find you on uh, Twitter, is that right? And yeah, you're Twitter. If I, um, I am on Identica, but I forget to hook the things up. And uh, I don't oh, we all do that. Um, so, and so I'm Ivanka on Twitter, and I'm Ivanka on IRC. I hang out on some free you know, channels. But please be warned that that I get by lots of people <laughs> uh, I may not get I can imagine straight away. fair enough and only yeah. some of them are us but yes anyway so thank you for uh, joining us this evening it's been really useful to find out your views on all this stuff and it's certainly made me think about things that I hadn't really considered were factors when you were looking at uh, interface design so uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll speak to you soon thank you very much thank you bye thank you bye, bye. bye. It's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Gerald. No. Okay, what's first? The Register have uh, an interview with Canonical's new CEO, Jane Silver. Oh, yes. It's very good, actually. Mm. There's um, some details. quite a lot of anal- analysis about sort of the company and, and how much money it could be making. And it's a bit speculative in places, but, you know, yeah. they've obviously given it some and thought. And how they only employ the world's best. They do, yeah. Yeah, but actually it's one thing... Like none thing, of us here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but one of the interesting things is, is Jane Silbert has always had a sort of presence. You know, we, we've always yeah. seen her around at the UDSs and things yeah. like that. But she, you know, she has what, always been employed by the company. But, no, but, <laughs> yes, but what I'm saying is, you know, she's always been there, but we don't really know her. You know, it's yes. Mark, Mark, okay. Mark blogs and things yes. like that. He's and the he, public face. Yeah, he's yes. out there. So it's actually quite interesting to see Jane of, of what she's got to say and, yeah. and her sort of impression of where the company's yeah. going mm-hmm. and things. And talking about how OEM services is like the biggest part of Canonical now. Mm. Um, and they've got offices in sort of Taipei or, you know, sort of yeah. out, out in the east working with OEMs, making, making Ubuntu work well on hardware. Well, so, you, you, you see these devices come out, like the little... The, the little, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> the little. The LITL. It's a laptop yes. that's tiny and it folds open and, mm. and, and that's got Ubuntu underneath it. And then, you know, Canonical helped Google with Chromium OS. Right. And you know, all these other, and, you know, Dell with their laptops yep. and you know, all these it's, other things. It's interesting how the company direction seems to have changed because my first impression was that, uh, or, or I thought it was actually announced that Canonical's core um, money making avenue was support services, mm. as in end-user support services. Mm. That's so, always been part of it. But yeah, really, but it's always it, been multi it seems it seemed to have sort of diverged to go with where, where the pot of gold is. Yeah, but to be fair, there's some of that stuff they can't do until they had a desktop that worked. Yeah. And once you've got a desktop that works and you can then show that to OEMs and say, look, we've got a desktop and we've got an engineering team who can get this working on your device – and keep the thing running on your device yeah. through the lifetime of oh, the project. Oh, don't get me wrong. Know, it makes stuff. perfect business sense. Yeah. 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 Mm. I, I'm just saying it's interesting to see how this sort of change and snake of, of, how, mm. of how the business is changing. Another detail that came up in there was um, the number of users. It mentions yes. the figure 10 million. Yes, a sort of as a hand wave in the yeah, air. Yeah, that, that is a sort of plucked figure, mm. I, I imagine. Yeah, well, I mean, it's based on the best information that Canonical could have, which is always going to be inaccurate. Mm. It's always going to be a least at least case i guess and then they've extrapolated from that that it's probably about sort of 10 million it's a bit like our download figures what did know. we t- <gasps> hush your mouth we know it's been at those least, are incredibly accurate we know it's been at least 10 therefore it must be nearly 1 million yes mm. so, yeah it can work <laughs> um there's been quite a lot of contro- uh, controversy in the blogosphere about the ubuntu's new look obviously we've just talked to ivanka about that um but Davey's made a blog post, so it must be something important. <laughs> <laughs> it went. It went. Through it came the out from strict... under his rock. No, <laughs> to make no. A blog my post. blog post went through the strict peer review processes that's required for a publication. And I must admit, <laughs> it is a very thoughtful analysis of the new desktop features in Dapper. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, these papers do take a long. But anyway, um, the things that I do feel somewhat misquoted with this because uh, I've said that basically I think it's good that it's being tried because what they're doing is moving yep. the um the the indicator the the, the control buttons maximize minimizing yep. close over to the left hand side of the top panel now um i'm not ready to adjust to that yet i mean basically my computer is meant to be functional and if it's slowing me down then it's i'm not ready to change how much did it slow you down enough for it to impact my computer experience to make it less enjoyable you did you gave it as it says in your blog post nearly an hour <laughs> so how much of that hour did you lose 
<laughs> I have still dabbled with going back to it, and you know, it, I'm not I'm not ready to adjust to that workflow. Right. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I was just giving instructions on on a, a, a how to a, change it, a reasonably easy way to change yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's that's fair enough. And but the thing uh, is, people have quoted me on different blogs. Yeah. You know, people don't like it. And I'm saying no. I'm not saying I don't like the idea of it. I don't like the principle of mm. it. It's just You're not saying, for here's, me. here's what to do if you want to change it back. Here's how you can. Yes, exactly. Yes. You just happen to be the first one to hit planet Ubuntu to say, this is how you change it back. It sucks. Look at this big red arrow. No, I did not say it sucks. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought you did. I must have misquoted. And somebody on kilobitspersecond.com has done a, a pretty thorough analysis of the... Uh, of the new look and the new logo and the themes and stuff that we talked about in the last episode, um, analyzing the font and details of the, the buttons and shadows and <laughs> pixel actually, borders and actually, stuff. I mean, you read what he said, and I'm not an artist. No, really? <laughs> However, <laughs> is that it, why your how, theme on your blog sucks? <laughs> 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 However, what he does say uh, may, actually makes perfect sense to a layman. Mm. And you can see he, or he obviously knows his stuff. And, it, you know, he has done a good analysis of it. We could ask Laura her opinion if she was here. Yeah, she's this is not. yet another occasion yet when, another we, occasion when we've made sure we talk about usability stuff when she's not here. She could even have a microphone if she was here. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, she's we've got Tux. Yes. Unfortunately, where she's at the moment, she's probably got a mobile switched off, so yes. we couldn't even do an interview. Yes. Now, we've got another one. Um, Webcam Studio for GNU slash Linux. Now, is that like Linux? <laughs> It's very it's, it's like Ubuntu. <laughs> yes, but, but 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 you added this one. Um, yeah, just I, I saw it come up, and and something that people ask a lot is, you know, is my webcam supported? And and you know the kind of things that people like to do with their webcam. You know, yeah. well, I don't know what everyone likes to do with their <laughs> webcam, on. and I don't want to speculate. Chat people roulette. <laughs> oh, God, um, but uh, it's a neat little app that um, lets you um, you know do kind of funky effects with your webcam and and stream your webcam to. Yeah, that's the thing that um, caught my eye. Is it, it, it uses it's compatible with three different streaming services: so uh, mm. Bambuser, UStream, and Stickam. Yeah, I mean, UStream is the only one I've really heard of, but um, I'm sure the others have got lots of users as well. Well, some of them already work with webcams natively, but this thing does it. It creates like a loopback device, mm. so that you can overlay on top of it funky, you know, graphics, and you could have like a lower third with your your name, so you could make like semi-production quality, you know, programming. Yeah. streaming oh, programming. It says you can broadcast your desktop, a webcam, a movie, some text, IRC channels, yeah. RSS switching, feeds. Switching between stuff. Lots now, of different you know, stuff. If this is the one I think it is, yeah, so it creates a virtual webcam. And what I did is I actually had one of the webcam sources was my desktop, huh. and I actually embedded my picture in the corner because I was doing a demonstration. Right. So I had the video of me in the corner mm. oh. with the desktop on the rest of the screen. Nice. <laughs> unlucky. <laughs> I was just thinking of the unlucky person but, who had yeah. you in the corner of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it actually did work quite well. I, I, I'm sure this is the software I use, isn't it? Well, I just tried to install it on Lucid here. The, the repository there is for Jaunty. I tried to install it on Lucid, and it fell over with a compile message. <laughs> but I'll, um, I'll file a bug. Yeah, lucky good of boy. Of course, yes. Pharonix have a comparison between a number of different desktops, including uh, KDE-based Kubuntu, Ubuntu, and Zubuntu, and another one, LXDE, to see uh, performance and relative memory usage. Okay, and which was best slash worst? Well, how do you measure best slash worst? Okay, which has... Well, you come should... on, this is Pharonix. They're going to have charts. Yes. yes, they have lots of charts. Okay, so which desktop uses the most memory up? I'm guessing XFDTC thing. No, it seemed to be... Oh. Yeah, funny that. See, that goes back to what Dave was saying at the beginning about me being the sarcastic person. Oh, I see yeah. what you did there. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, apparently Kubuntu or KDE right. seem to use quite a bit and know okay. a little bit less. And then, as you'd expect, XFC a little bit less and then LXD a bit less than that. Yeah, it's yeah. not exactly to surprising. Be fair, to be fair, there's not... A whole lot in it i mean the only thing sure. i can really see in the chart is on system memory usages kde does use more than the others it's but right. other than that they're all pretty much in line mm. it's all those clocks <laughs> kde you have to support and that's all in the bit about ubuntu this Gerald. time <laughs> <laughs> lots of lovely feedback in uh, this time around sadly we haven't got time to include it all uh, but we do read all of it and listen to the audio feedback as yep. well and watch video feedback if, you, if you send it, which we haven't had I've yet. I've never had that happen. No. <laughs> Russell Dickinson commented on our blog saying, I've said it before, but I imagine you'll never get sick of hearing it. Well done. Even though I don't use Ubuntu and I'm not likely to in the near future, I really enjoy listening to your podcast. 
Well done. I'm so sick of people saying oh, that. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. It's always nice to hear that. Although I'd be interested to know why Russell enjoys the podcast but doesn't use Ubuntu and is unlikely to. And yeah, interestingly... Maybe he's just a committed glory user or something. Interestingly, how he come across the podcast as well. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it, does he have a circle of friends that are podcasts? I, Russell, you need you to need answer to, these you questions. You do need to tell us, yeah. Russell. Everyone's favourite Scottish furry, Mr. Ben, emailed in to say... Firstly, I did a talk on usability and the average user at Lug Radio Live 08 called Supporting World Domination. I believe there might even be some video of it somewhere. Yes, indeed there is. It is at lugradio.org slash live slash UK 2008 slash schedule. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. We will do. Secondly, am I the only one who watches Windows 7 adverts saying, my name is X and I'm w- and Windows 7 was my idea? And here, we are Microsoft and Windows 7 is not our fault. <laughs> so mm. Microsoft like, passing the buck. That's, that's what a good hears. way of looking at it, isn't it? Yes. Charles Yarnold sent us this just a moment. My... Just a moment is about a special kind of Ubuntu compatibility that I've noticed recently, which I'm calling girlfriend compatibility. Now, I'm a boy, she's a girl, and without turning this into a bad Avril Lavigne song, I'm the geek in the relationship. Now, back a few years ago when I first installed Ubuntu at her request on her malware infested Windows box, I said, Obviously, you're going to have to swap what programs you use. You already use Firefox and Thunderbird, so there's a crossover already. But we'll sort out, and we'll keep it running happily. Which worked fine for years, sorted it all out. And the other day she said to me, I'm getting bored of the sticky note application that I use. I said, oh, it's fine, we'll look through the list. And she said, no, no, I've already sorted it out myself. I went to the Ubuntu Software Center, downloaded, and installed it from there. Which means that's one less thing I have to worry about. And that's priceless. That was very good. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, there's a joke in there about viruses, but it's probably inappropriate in that context. Evgeny Kuznetsov has emailed in with lashings of intended sarcasm to stick the boot into the rationale behind Ubuntu's new look. Focusing on visual appearance and restyling rather than engineering and fixing bugs is exactly the way Microsoft has gone with Windows. And as a result, they've got by far the largest market share. That's obviously the approach that should be taken if we're ever going to fix famous bug number one. And I'm glad Canonical has finally done the right thing. Someday the decision had to be made whether it was more important to fix bug one or fix thousands of other bugs and finally make a decent system. Wow, yeah. the sarcasmatron has exploded there. Absolutely, not backwards about coming forwards in that no. one. Yes, yeah, so I suppose it's, a, it's an interesting point. Is it is it right yes. to go after the bug number one beat marks at all costs, or should we just be making the best system? He's got it all wrong. When it doesn't look anything like Windows 7. <laughs> Everyone should know it's Mac OS X. <laughs> That's a fair point. Mark Law emailed in to ask... Whether there is a connection between the Cadbury Brown Purple Link and the Ubuntu Brown Purple Diversification... Undoubtedly, the possibility of subliminal stimuli can't be ignored. Were marketing gurus at Canonical cooking up a change of brown to purple, knowing it would it would create familiarity with the new brand on a subliminal level? Mmm, chocolate. Conspiracy theories abound. Mm. Chris Blow, who goes by excellent online identity of Lumpy Custard, let us know that the interception of DNS settings on Virgin Media Connections that you talked about in the last episode can be turned off on the configuration panel. Yeah. I, I the first time it it, it occurred it, it threw me a bit and um yeah there's just a page you get diverted to where you switch it off. Right. It's good to know you can turn it off anyway. Yeah. Ross Anderson emailed us with his list of woes with Ubuntu, including support for his Lexmark printer, wireless, sound and Google Earth. He also says that Generally installing software is a pain with dependencies that need checking and downloading, etc. By the way, I love your podcast. Far better than the other one. Which one is that? There's no idea. Know. There are no other ones. What's he talking but, about? Every time we say there are no other ones, we get told off. I there know. are lots of other ones and they're very good, but I don't know which one. No, hang means. on. Radio 4 do do lots oh, of podcasts. Yes. That's right, yes. But um, yeah, uh, it, the interesting thing with the dependencies and downloading is that I thought they was all automatic. Yeah, I, I, it is. it's tricky because I think some people have got that expectation that you have to do all that dependency stuff and also don't i think there's plenty of people who don't know about software center or synaptic or the fact that it's possible to you know get stuff inside the desktop without going off to some website and they they do a google and say how do i get google earth right and they find some button they click and download a bin file and that says you need lib yada 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 so 
Do you, you know, think, or, I mean, on a side note of that, do you think people still think the Linux computer is all about compiling from source? I think there's a lot of people who think that. Yeah. Did you know, I, I met a guy in a pub in Copenhagen, and it was 10 years ago, and I spotted him across the pub wearing a Slashdot t-shirt, <laughs> and that's how you know he's a geek. And we were chatting at the bar, and this other guy came over and he said, oh, that Linux stuff, it will never take off. Now, bear in mind, this is 10 years ago. And he said, uh, that will never take off on the desktop. And I was like, why? Why is that? And he said, oh, you have to do RM. If you want to do it, remove a directory, you have to use minus R and all these obscure command line parameters. I was like, no, you don't. You click on it and you press the delete button. You know, you, know, you use a GUI just like you do on everyone else. But there is this, mm-hmm. I mean, there still was then, but and there still is now. People still think you have to be you know, rocket scientist to use it. I mean, he's got a fair point, though, that sometimes hardware isn't very well supported. So, I mean, Lexmark printers are well known for their lack of support on on linux mm. um and wireless can be tricky if you've got the wrong chipset but you know i think things generally are much much better than they used to be and even you know much better than installing windows out of the box mm. for a lot of people yeah absolutely on a similar note it most rights to say if i found a linux operating system as simple as windows or less technical to use i will use it immediately i totally agree with the quote that linux is made by geeks for geeks and an unhappy face. Mm. Oh, sad, smiley. Oh dear. Get on there. I, I'd be interested to know again, just reflecting what you were saying. What is it that that is very technical? Sure, you can get technical with it, and you can you know play around on the command line and and do all that sort of stuff. But you don't have to. Well, I guess the problem is when it breaks or when you have to do something that's a bit out of the ordinary. Yeah, I think I think over yeah. time we've eaten away at all the out of the ordinary things like yes. software installation and plug-in installation and codec installation and printer setup and webcam configuration. All these things we've eaten away at, and there's a GUI for everything, yeah. and there's or or it, or it just works out the box and you don't have to do anything. But there's still like edge cases like a DVB card where you have to manually scan channels and yeah. or you know some other like Bluetooth thing where you have to monkey around with a comp file or something. There's still some weird stuff. Or your infrared remote. Yes. There's still some stuff out there where you do have to hack away at files. Yeah. Do you know, I, I would like to make the, um, the estimation that, say, 10 years ago, I would say more than half of Linux users were uh, low-level coders in assembler and things like that. Yeah, if I could make the same assumption now, I would say it's under two percent. That, that that that's my personal guess. But I think the actual user and the developers are less technical in mass than they used to be. Yeah, I think broadly you're right. I mean, I'm not sure quite where the numbers. Oh, it, it's it's just a number from. I'm plucking the out. Number you're plucking out. Okay, but I mean th- th- that's the sort of numbers I would expect of the users and the whole user and developer base. Mm. Yeah, it's certainly getting in the hands of people that aren't particularly technical, which is great. Alan Rogers has let us know that he's working through the archives of the show and kindly emailed us on his thoughts on most segments of season two. Yeah, big email, that one. That was a monster, wasn't it? Yeah. He, <laughs> he actually went through a lot of the things we talked about in the episodes. Mm. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure we can bring up some of them We're because not it's really too bring long up any ago. Of them. Not right now, but, you know, <laughs> but yeah, whenever but anyone does us, give us feedback, we do, we do read it. It, it was interesting reading, and actually it, it, it reminded me of some of the things we'd covered that even I'd forgotten. Yeah, and hopefully he'll hear this in a year or so when he's caught up on season three <laughs> and hear his name read out. So thanks, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Alan. That's all your feedback this time. Thanks for joining us. It's been a really good episode. It's been a very long episode. Very long I, I think episode. it's up to our audience to judge whether it was a really good episode. No, no, I think no, it's no, been really I good. Think oh, well, I, I think it was, but if you think differently, perhaps let us know. Yeah, um, so email is podcast at ubuntu-uk.org and every other way of getting in touch with us, including our Twitter, Identica and voicemail stuff, is on the website. Thank you for listening. Yeah, join us next time. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. bye-bye.